the most interesting guests in the music industry, entertainment, art, and politics. Step into the studio for Turning Point with Frank McKenna. And now, Turning Point with Frank McKenna. Welcome to Turning Point. Our very special guest today is Dan Spitz, lead guitarist of the band Anthrax. Dan, how are you? All right, having a good day here today. Thanks for having me on. Where are you, where are you based out of? Uh, we're in Palm Beach, Palm Beach, Florida, where it's nice and warm and toasty in the middle of the winter and palm trees and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah, well, not not your hometown. Your former hometown is not experiencing uh, as nice a weather. Uh, Rockland County, right? New York? That's right. Rockland County is, uh, for those who don't know, about a half hour north of the of Manhattan, and that's where I grew up. And I also uh, had a house one mile from the original Woodstock, 1969 Woodstock, where Hendrix played Woodstock, uh, site that we would spend all summer at. Um, went to day camp up there and um, uh, uh, had like a small community of like a couple hundred homes on a lake with boats and all that kind of cool stuff. And that's where my some of my lifelong friends are from. And uh, so we got to, you know... Um, uh, when I was about eight years old, when Woodstock was there, and give out water to all the hippies who camped out in my backyard because there's only two access roads to that site, and one of them is uh, goes behind my house and where all my land was, what my dad had owned. So all the tents were on my backyard and uh, all that kind of cool stuff. So there's been music around me um, at all times. And uh, what's funny is people, uh, you know, now it's rebuilt up there and. Uh, there was always those anniversaries and all that kind of stuff. And I remember the, the 10th anniversary um, of Woodstock, and it was about me and eight of my friends on the field, and there was nobody else. Wow. <laughs> it's just like a big field, you know? Yeah. Cause we grew up there, and it wasn't until about like the, fifth, the 20th that they, when they when they get the rights to put up the monument and all that kind of stuff, after Max Yasger, who on the land, died, um, um, his, his wife finally caved in and let the monument go up because he was pissed that but uh, the way they left the land after the concert you know like it was his land was destroyed that was his that was his income um, and he was pissed and swore that like you know no one would touch my land again you know so he never let them build the monument and once he was he, he was dead then it all kind of came alive so yeah there's just music everywhere where, where i go man and where would dan spitz lead guitarist of the band anthrax uh did you know max yasger Personally? Uh, yes, I did. I did know Max Jasker. My dad um, was uh, was a, an attorney that did a lot of work. Uh, uh, he's an attorney in Manhattan, but he did a lot of work for um, his friends up there. Were was the chief deputy sheriff up there, so um, he did a lot of work during the summertime for people and uh, the in need people, if you know what I mean, uh, yeah. for the community. And yes, Max was uh, was a was a friend that we knew. Yes. When did you When did you start playing guitar? Um, well, I kind of followed suit for my brother. For those who don't know, my brother is Dave the Beast Spitz. He's played in Black Sabbath and White Lion and Great White. And as far as I'm concerned, one of the top bass players ever to walk the planet. Yeah. Um, you know, he's about he's five attorney. years older, right? Is he about five years? He's about five years old, and now he's an attorney down here in Florida as well. And uh, so so he was always, you know, blasting me out of bed, you know, playing bass. And uh, so as a little brother would do, I kind of followed suit, but, you know, picked up the guitar and, my dad, um, his hobby was collecting really loud stereos, like giant thousands of watt amplifiers with huge speakers. And he was into uh, um, big band jazz, uh, Frank Sinatra, Benny Goodman, uh, guitar players like Django Reinhardt were, were blasting in my house at you know six in the morning on a Saturday, even when we were teenagers and you know going out and getting drunk and all that kind of stuff that teenagers do and not coming home till four in the morning at about six, you know, he, he, all of a sudden, you know, you're hearing horn sections blasting at a thousand yeah. watts in my house. So, <laughs> um, I had a funny childhood of, of not being able to escape music. And, uh, I'm very thankful for that. Um, because that's, I guess where my, um, uh, uniqueness of how I play came from. Um, and I strive for, I always, uh, strive for that. It's to me, it's not, a, um, a matter of exact proficiency that makes someone um, an artist. It's uh, a uniqueness where within, within a few seconds um, 
anyone can can s- describe or know who that person is. Just like uh, you know, you listen to say Joe Perry from Aerosmith, and in two seconds you know who he is, or Frank Zappa, or you know, that's to me an artist. There are you know, you can separate that and and uh, and call people uh, shredders. Yeah. And say, man, well, what a proficiency that that gentleman doesn't make any mistakes whatsoever, and that's also incredible. But for me, I strive for uh, uniqueness in what I do and call it art, and rather than just playing music. Well, you mentioned Django, uh, and just in passing, kind of. Did you listen to many jazz guitarists? Yeah, I grew up. Uh, actually, uh, the first thing I did was take a year of. Uh, jazz lessons from a gentleman named uh, Richie Hart, who is George Benson's uh, guitar player. Wow. And um, that's what got me going fast. Um, and then I moved into the school jazz band. And even though I was kind of a, a metalhead, I figured that's the f- I would gain speed faster um, in, a, in the learning process uh, by studying with someone like that. And after about a year, um, he was trying to tell me things that I, I didn't agree with, such as you know, you, you, you don't vibrato a note, you know, you bend it to exactness. And, you know, I'm sitting there listening to, like, Van Halen 1 going, D- D- dude, right. are you freaking out of your mind? <laughs> like, I'm saying to myself, I'm like, this is my last lesson yeah. with you. Like, I'm, I'm done now. I know enough. Yeah. Like, and I went to uh, a, f- a guy in my neighborhood, and I took, like, two lessons from this guy, um, um, like, teaching me, like, ACDC and Van Halen songs, and then uh, that's all I needed to know, and I just taught myself from that point on. But what age and was you that? Got, you got to remember, that's before the internet, and you could just get tabs and all that kind of stuff that everyone has now. It's, uh, you know, you, you're on your own, dude. Yeah, you, had, you needed records. I, you know, I mean, every once yeah, in a while, a guitar you, player you, would put yeah, something. Yeah, we were, like, slowing the records down with our finger. Like, we didn't have computers to keep it in key as it slows <laughs> yeah. down. And You know, but back then, that, that's what made us... Um, like someone say, it's such as, uh, you know, me and Scott and James and Kirk from Metallica and the guys in Slayer and, and Mustaine and everybody. That's what made us um, the players that we are when we finally hit the studio, um, you know, and we had our our, our sound of, of where we came from in our, in our heads and we were trying to invent that sound and have amplifier companies and, you know, make different amps for us that covered bass guitar frequencies that didn't exist yet and all that. But when we finally hit the studio... You know, we were workaholics where, and we were perfectionists where it was, you know, one take Joe, you know, and then double that track and then triple it and then quadruple it. And, you know, those times, you know, didn't exist before us. Um, and it's only because um, of what we grew up with and, and our determination to, uh, to to be perfect in, in it, but in a non-perfect way, you know, be I- unique. How do you how do you like the new developments or relatively new developments like Pro Tools and things? Do you have a setup in your home? Oh, of course, I'm Mister Technology. As, as anyone that knows me knows, you know, I, I took yeah. 10, 15 years off and you know headed to Switzerland to to mess around with the world's most you know complicated mechanical watches. So my room when I was growing up looked like freaking NASA blew up at all times. Um, <laughs> I was always I'm always the fix it guy. Yeah, and um, that that that's. That was my dad again. You know, he's a was an attorney, and people that wouldn't pay him, in in uh, he had a lot of clients in Manhattan that um had that kind of like sold illegal cable boxes and illegal Gucci bags and illegal Sony stereos, and they would buy him by the truckloads, broken and try and fix them. And um, you know, he would the guy didn't pay him in full. He would just go in and fill his trunk up with a bunch of broken, you know, AM FM A track record player things, you know, and get like ten of them. So he'd come home every night. And I didn't say go out to the trunk. You know, there's like five, six stereos in there. One, the record player works. One, the A-track works. One, the AM/FM works. One, two of them. I don't know, but if you can make something out of it, the guy wasn't paying me anyway. So cool. So you know, I would bring him inside and just figure out how to rip them apart and make something out of them, make it work. As a little kid, so uh, I was the I was the kid in the neighborhood who who was always fixing that kind of crap. So it, for me, Pro Tools and um, you know, actually, I use Ableton Live. Um, that's that's my full bore, full on, um, I, my my creative way. Uh, I like the way it, it, I can loop things and work in little blocks and move them around and so forth when I'm creating. Um, so it, for me, it, you know, I love technology. I embrace it, and and uh, once again, it's it's it comes from my past. Um, I'm not one to conform to what is now. I'm one to hopefully look into ten percent of what could be in the future and and try to make that happen. 
and um, that's what I'm trying to do with you know with with Red Lamb and you know and and um, and, um, and break new ground. You know, no nobody in music has uh, has uh, stood for a permanent cause. Um, you, know, you know, meaning just bringing awareness about my daily life, me and Candy with, with our twins with autism. We're with Dan Spitz, lead guitarist of the band Anthrax. Turning Point with Frank McKay returns right after this. Welcome back to Turning Point with Frank McKay. We're with Dan Spitz, lead guitarist of the band Anthrax. Well, let's give that a little bit of a setup. Uh, I, I spoke to Candy, and she's doing wonderful work, and the two of you are just doing great stuff. Uh, Dan Spitz, uh, lead guitarist of Anthrax and Red Lamb, uh, is also an advocate, a uh, wonderful advocate for a very important cause, uh, and that's autism. And you have twin boys that uh, that suffer from autism, and that's what sprung you guys into action. Let's you know, Tell us about Autism Speaks and everything else you guys are doing. Uh, well, Autism Speaks is is a uh, you know the the largest global organization um, uh, that me and Candy had found when our children were diagnosed and they weren't born autistic. Just so everyone knows, they were acting in movies with Maggie Gyllenhaal when they were nine years old or even actually younger. They were in commercials with Brooke Shields, so you know speaking and and acting and all that. So you know this is video proof not by mommy and daddy if you know what i mean that, that everything was fine and around 18 yeah. months to 16 months they started to regress and uh at that time you know um things like ipads and ipods weren't around to help and there was a lot of let's say uh snake oil kind of stuff out there that people were trying to sell and the first organization we we found it was just basically here's your truthful information you know was autism speaks like we don't want anything from you here's your info dude you know, there's not even a blood test to know your kid has it. Um, blah 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 blah. And we were like, that that's really cool. And that's basically what you know, Red Lamb and Anarchy for Autism tour. That will it's a permanent tour. It's not gonna it's not one show somewhere to raise to raise money or something like that. It's a permanent tour for just that same kind of thing where it just brings some awareness to the world that statistically, you know, something's wrong when there's one in every fifty fourth boy born is now going to be autistic or on the spectrum, we call it, and there's schools popping up everywhere. And if you add up every other disease in the world, you know, most of them, you know, the big diseases, statistically, it doesn't come close to what this is. Mm. So it's kind of going to be a, a look into the spit household. So there'll be videos, and video cameras on the road, and when Brenda and Jaden come out, you'll, you'll get to see the, the daily struggle that our family goes through and uh, get a little dose of reality, which is what thrash metal is. It's truth. Yeah. You know, when we when we started this ride many years ago, Scott and I, and and everyone else, uh, it was called the Big Four. Now, you know, it, it was about hey man, we're so fed up with with hey baby, I love you lyrics and and come on down and let's go drinking and get messed up. You know, it, it was more about you know, look, dude, man, my day sucks, yeah. and you know what I'm reading in the news that really sucks, and it's about time. You know, it comes from the punk era of just. Like, it's time somebody just spoke every word being the truth of what bothers them, you know? Even blues, and you go and back, way back. It, it, that's what Red Lamb is. It's like, you know what? Uh, me and Candy live in a, in a private hell here, and guess what? You know, here's a dose of truth, and I'm back to play, and, you know, here you go, buddy. Yeah. Well, it, it, the, the cause itself has such little awareness when it comes down to it. And you just said a, a statistic. Did you say one in 54 boys? One in 54 boys and one in every 88 human uh, born now. It's unbelievable. And that statistic, that's the CDC statistic, and actually, there, you know, as you know, it takes them six years to come up with a statistic. So that statistic is actually uh, quite old. But actually, I have to kind of disagree with you in one little thing there. Yeah. In most other art forms, such as film, there's many advocates. In, in car racing, uh, there's, a, there's huge advocates. Of course, ever, most people know that as Dan Marino has huge foundations in football. In Europe, there's soccer people. There's no one in music that's not just, you know, the, yeah. you know, you can, you can stand up advocate on my forehead. That, that's fine with me because that, I like that. Um, but there's no one, say, in music, you know, like putting a Dave Mustaine and a Dan Spitz together. And going, hey, you know what? We're gonna, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna co-write lyrics to a song, um, and, and you know, try to make it, try to make a little bit of headway here, you know, underground style. Bro. Does, does Dave have uh, autism in his family? Dave, no, but Dave's lived at my house, and you know that he's seen 
and, you know, and held my children and, and, you know, knows what we go through. Um, you know, when I have to go out to his studio to, to record, um, you know, he, he, he witnesses the daily struggle of my phone, <laughs> yeah. you know, of meltdowns of, you know, you know, just, you know, it, I can't even begin to explain what we go through. You know, yeah. you can't take your children anywhere. We have, we have chains on our doors. We can't go, me and Candy can't just go out to eat. Um, last week or so was the first time since they were born that Candy and I were able to go see a movie because my eldest daughter is here and that's the only person that, that knows their patterns. You know, it's kind of, they they have coupled OCD. So everything, nothing can change. You know, the color of a cup, the way the straw is, the way you hand it to them, anything like that, they, nothing can change. They, they can't just adapt. You can't take them to the supermarket. Um, you know, when, when Candy has tried to take them to Target, you know, uh, she'd call me and there's three cop cars around her car because the lady next to her thought that she was abusing her child because one of them went into a meltdown and she's trying to calm them down and he's screaming and, you know, trying to self-injure himself. But when you look at our kids, they look normal. You know, don't, yeah. don't think they, they you know, no one would think that they uh, were autistic. So those are the things, you know, that, that we go through just 1% of, of, of what we go through here. So it's just about time, you know, I pick up my guitar and play. We're with Dan Spitz, lead guitarist of the band Anthrax. Turning Point with Frank McKay returns right after this. Welcome back to Turning Point with Frank McKay. We're with Dan Spitz, lead guitarist of the band Anthrax. Is traveling with the boys unheard of? Um, different. We, you know, we... We don't listen to certain people that tell us we can't. You know, right. we're um, especially Candy. You know, um, you know, Candy has the master's degrees, and and I'm just a street smart dude. You know, yeah. so we, we're a good team. Where you know, when people tell us, well, you know, your kid will never talk. Your kid will never talk. And then you know, and the lady's been an autism therapist for 21 years, and she's about ready to give up. You know, um, and not come anymore. And she's tried everything. And then that same day, we turn around and we watch the kid, one of our children. You know, reach in her bag, grab her iPhone, crack her code to get in, and start rearranging all our apps uh, at two years yeah. old. Amazing. You know, so so they have height and skills. You know, from there they they, they learned. This is before anyone knew that, that that iPods at that time could help any uh, autistic children. Um, so well, well touch on you know, that. We, we I, I, I'm ignorant to that. We don't take no for an answer. So you know, if you follow our Facebook, you'll see we're always going to Disney, and there's people that write in, "Oh, have a good time, Dan and Candy." No, we don't have a good right. time. But it's listen, about keep taking them back, you know, and and they tell us what ride to go on, and after ten times, you know, they'll they go on the same, you know, Dumbo ride. You want to go on Dumbo? Dumbo. Okay, where you want to go now? You go on the next ride. Okay, where you want to go now? Dumbo. Back to Dumbo. The familiarity, you know, that over and over through repetition, eventually, as they get older and older, we hope that they can go somewhere and live somewhat of a normal life. And, you know, other people will tell us, you can't do that. You know what, dude? Too bad. Do you, do you have a support group around of people that are going through the same thing that you're going through? Oh, well, of course. My, my wife is, you know, um, uh, um, a spokesperson for autism speaks or faces. But uh, I'm saying close simple, by. Almost so, yeah. Yes, we have all, you know, support groups everywhere of other people that live what we live uh, and uh, or, or have lived it and have older children on the spectrum. And what do you, uh, what do you experience as far as the, uh, as far as the support goes? I mean, how far does it go? Now, you guys are in a different situation, I assume, financially than, than some people that, that deal with it, but it's got to be devastating financially for, you know, many couples or single, you know, single parents out there that are raising autistic kids. I mean, uh, all your money goes to, uh, to, to dealing with the, uh, the issue and the, and the problems that surround autism. Am I right about that? Yeah, of, of course. Uh, it's just, you know, it's millions and millions of dollars to raise one child. We have two identical mirror image twins who are affected differently, even though they're from the same egg. And then it's the same human genome-wise. They have different sets of problems. Um, so, yes, it's, uh, you know, we're, we're fortunate enough where uh, they just built a brand new autism school, literally at the end of our, at the end of our development. So uh, that's, you know, we're blessed that way, but you know, the additional therapy and all that kind of stuff is you're on your own, you know. The the web the website is autismspeaks.org, am I right? 
Pardon me? The, the website is autismspeaks.org? Yes. Yeah, let's just give it again. Uh, autismspeaks.org for anyone who's listening. Well, it, also, if you, you know, if you, it, whoever's going to be coming to Red Lamb shows and as, you know, we build up speed a little bit and all that kind of stuff, there's going to be a few shirts that, you know, people can buy um, uh, for a t- from a t-shirt company called Give Back Couture, which give back means obviously give back. Um, that'll go to um, Autism Speaks because they, they're just strictly information and research. They have their own research team so that there's no BS between somebody that was hiring people to, to give false information, you know. And the other part is an organization that's literally going to put uh, musical instruments into autism schools and into children on the spectrum as we know what music can do across the board for not just autism but so many other areas where you know it just can open so many doors um, that to people who who were maybe you know not completely nonverbal and all of a sudden you know they have a voice just like I have a voice for my guitar um, you know I'm a I'm a guy who never likes to leave the house you know but I, I speak to my instrument and um, you know it, why shouldn't uh, why shouldn't these schools and these children be you know, be filled with uh, all kinds of instruments. And so it, I'm I'm here to kind of just give back a little bit, you know. Dan Spitz from Red Lamb and Anthrax. Uh, what could people do that want to be helpful uh, to the cause? Where can, uh, again, uh, autismspeaks.org, I guess, is where you'd point them. But what can they do to be helpful? You know, just, oh, just follow what, what I'm doing, you know, and it's just bringing awareness. That's all, really. It's just the awareness of, you know, of, um, of you know, something's, something's, something's wrong. You know, if the cease to, when I grew up, there wasn't autism schools. There wasn't a need for them. Um, so something's wrong. And, you know, in true metal style, um, you know, we're, we're, we're not just metal people anymore. Um, we, we didn't go away. Like everyone said, uh, we would all just grow up and start listening to freaking Burt Bacharach or something, you know? Like we're a, a global force of people that uh, uh, people who started listening to metal back when Black Sabbath and 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 so on and so forth started. They're all politicians and lawyers and doctors and 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 in a global way. We're a very very powerful force, just like the, the movie industry is. And if we all kind of get together, and which we are starting to do now, people a lot of people are starting to realize that we can really make an impact on humanity. Dan Spitz has been our very special guest today. He's the lead guitarist of Red Lamb and is an advocate of, of autism. And AutismSpeaks.org is the name of the uh, is the website, and the name of the organization is Autism Speaks. Uh, Dan, also the lead guitarist from the band Anthrax. Dan, you're, you're doing great things. You and your wife both. Congratulations on you guys. And, and hey, listen, God bless you. And, and same to you, and we appreciate any and all uh, time and uh, effort that's made to, you know, just to help bring uh, the awareness and get people to our shows, you know. That's what it's all about. Just more and more people that, um, you know, will, will, will come to see Red Lamb and hopefully uh, the Anarchy for Autism Tour. And, um, you know, in its infancy stage, is going to be the same kind of thing as, you know, when me and Scott started, uh, you know, Anthrax and everybody else, you know, in, in that infancy stage that we helped to grow this to, you know, it's a continuum around the world that just keeps getting bigger and bigger and more more bands join in who are bigger and bigger and it just becomes something really, really cool that uh, that opens the eyes of people who um, uh, would have never, um, you know, ha- have known about this before. That's all. Look, if, if two fans come to the show and they're just coming to see some good music and it's a festival or whatever it is, and then there's Dan Spitz and Red Lamb, and, you know, one kid knows about my background, and he brought his friend, and the other friend goes, you know, and he goes to his friend, hey, look, that, that's freaking Spitz. He used to be in that band Anthrax or whatever it is, and, he, you know, he's got two kids with autism, and, you know, he punches him in the head, and the kid goes, what the hell is autism? And then the kid tells him, you know, to, to, dude, it's this, it's that. That's all I'm trying to do. You know, bring, spread, bring awareness. Spread, spread the disease from one to another. Right. You know, I'm still spreading the disease. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're, uh, you're doing great things. Hey, listen, both you and Candy, uh, once again, congratulations. Thanks all for you, what all you guys are doing. Uh, thanks for being here on the show, too. And, and please, uh, let's do a follow up on this. You got it. Dan Spitz has been our special guest on Turning Point. Thank you for tuning in. And again, check out autismspeaks.org. Autismspeaks.org. 
and check out Red Lamb uh, whenever you get a chance. Uh, great band, Dave Mustaine uh, and Dan Spitz. We'll talk to you all next week on Turning Point. Thanks for tuning in. Turning Point with Frank McKay is brought to you by Herman Katz Congemi and Klein, Duffy and Duffy, Gold Coast Bank, Heartland Business Center, Morgan Stanley and Smith Barney of PC Wealth Management, and the Hagadone Little Village School in Seaford, New York. Turning Point with Frank McKay was produced by GVP Digital Media in Rockakama, New York. Executive producers Frank McKay and Harry Oates. Associate producers Kristen and John McKay. Audio and studio engineering Brittany Fergo and Francis Kazmarek. Hotel and accommodations provided by Ohika Castle Hotel and Estate in Huntington, New York. Transportation services provided by Mark of Elegance Limousine in Hopog, New York. Catering services provided by Chella Bagels of Selden, New York. The most interesting guests in the music industry, entertainment, art, and politics. Step into the studio for Turning Point with Frank McKenna. And now, Turning Point with Frank McKenna. Welcome to Turning Point. Our very special guest today is Dan Spitz, lead guitarist of the band Anthrax. Dan, how are you? All right, having a good day here today. Thanks for having me on. Where where are you based out of? Uh, We're in Palm Palm Beach, Florida where it's nice and warm and toasty in the middle of the winter and palm trees and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah, well, not, not your hometown. Your former hometown is not experiencing uh, as nice a weather. Uh, Rockland County, right, New York? That's right. Rockland County is, uh, for those who don't know, about a half hour north of, the, of Manhattan, and that's where I grew up. And I also uh, had a house one mile from the original Woodstock, 1969 Woodstock, where Hendrix played Woodstock uh, site that we would spend all summer at um, with the day camp up there and um, uh, uh, had like a small community of like a couple hundred homes on a lake with boats and all that kind of cool stuff. And that's where my some of my lifelong friends are from. And uh, so we got to, you know, um, uh, when I was about eight years old when Woodstock was there and give out water to all the hippies who camped out in my backyard because there's only two access roads to that site and one of them is uh goes behind my house and where all my land was with my dad had owned so all the tents were on my backyard and uh all that kind of cool stuff so there's been music around me um at all times and uh what's funny is people uh you know now it's rebuilt up there and uh there's always those anniversaries and all that kind of stuff and I remember the, the 10th anniversary um, of Woodstock, and it was about me and eight of my friends on the field, and there was nobody else. Wow. <laughs> it's just like a big field, you know? Yeah. Cause we, we grew up there, and it wasn't until about like the, the 20th that they, when they when they got the rights to put up the monument and all that kind of stuff, after Max Yasger, who on the land, died, um, um, his, his wife finally caved in and let the monument go up because he was pissed. Guys and Slayer and, and Mustaine and everybody. That's what made us um, the players that we are when we finally hit the studio, um, you know, and we had our our, our sound of, of where we came from in our, in our heads and we were trying to invent that sound and have amplifier companies and, you know, make different amps for us that covered bass guitar frequencies that didn't exist yet and all that. But when we finally hit the studio, you know, we were workaholics where, and we were perfectionists where... It was, you know, one take Joe, you know, and then double that track and then triple it and then quadruple it. And, you know, those times, you know, didn't exist before us. Um, and it's only because um, of what we grew up with and, and our determination to, uh, to to be perfect, in, in a, but in a non-perfect way, you know, be how, unique. You know, how, do you, how do you like the new developments or relatively new developments like Pro Tools and things? Do you have a setup in your home? Oh, of course. I'm Mr. Technology, as, as anyone that knows me knows, you know, I, I took yeah. 10, 15 years off and, you know, headed to Switzerland to, to mess around with the world's most, in, you know, complicated mechanical watches. So my room when I was growing up looked like freaking NASA blew up at all times. Um, <laughs> I was always, I'm always the fix-it guy. Yeah. And um, that, that, that's, that was my dad again, you know, he was an attorney and people that wouldn't pay him in, in uh, he had a lot of clients in Manhattan that, um, 
had that kind of like sold illegal cable boxes and illegal Gucci bags and illegal Sony stereos and they would buy him by the truckloads broken and try and fix them and um, you know he would the guy didn't pay him in full he would just go in and fill his trunk up with a bunch of broken you know AM FM A track record player things you know and get like ten of them so he'd come home every night and then say go out to the trunk you know there's like five six stereos in there one the record player works one the A track works one the AM FM works one two of them I don't know but if you can make something out of it the guy wasn't paying me anyway. So cool. So, you know, I would bring him inside and just figure out how to rip him apart and make something out of him and make it work as a little kid. So uh, I was the, that was the kid in the neighborhood who, who was always fixing that kind of crap. So it, for me, Pro Tools and, um, you know, actually I use Ableton Live. Um, that's that's my full bore, full on, um, I, my, my creative way. Uh, I like the way it, it, I can loop things of exact proficiency that makes someone um, an artist. It's a, a uniqueness where within, within a few seconds, um, anyone can can s- describe or know who that person is. Just like, uh, you know, you listen to, say, Joe Perry from Aerosmith, and in two seconds you know who he is, or Frank Zappa, or, you know, that's, to me, an artist. There are, you know, you can separate that and and uh, and call people uh, shredders yeah. and say, man, well, what a proficiency that, that gentleman doesn't make any mistakes whatsoever. And that's also incredible. But for me, I strive for uh, uniqueness in what I do and call it art and rather than just playing music. Well, you mentioned Django uh, and just in passing kind of. Uh, did you listen to many jazz guitarists? Yeah, I grew up. Uh, actually, uh, the first thing I did was take a year of uh, jazz lessons from a gentleman named uh, Richie Hart, who is George Benson's uh, guitar player. Wow. And um, that's what got me going fast. Um and then I moved into the school jazz band, and even though I was kind of a, a metalhead, I figured that's the f- I would gain speed faster um, in a, in the learning process uh, by studying with someone like that. And after about a year, um, he was trying to tell me things that I, I didn't agree with, such as you know you, you you don't vibrato a note, you know you bend it to exactness, and you know I'm sitting there listening to like Van Halen one going. Dude, right. are you freaking out of your mind? Like I'm saying to myself, I'm like this is my last lesson yeah. with you. Like I'm I'm done now. I know enough. Yeah. Like, and I went to uh, a, f- a guy in my neighborhood, and I took like two lessons from this guy, um, um, like teaching me like ACDC and Van Halen songs, and then uh, that's all I needed to know. And I just taught myself from that point on. But what age and was you that? Got, you got to remember that's before the internet, and you could just get tabs and all that kind of stuff that everyone has now. It's uh you know, you, you're on your own, dude. Yeah, you, had, you needed records. I, you know, I mean, every once yeah, in a while, you, a guitar you, you, player you, would put yeah, something. Yeah, we were, like, slowing the records down with our finger. Like, we didn't have computers to keep it in key as it slows <laughs> yeah. down. And You know, but back then, that, that's what made us, um, like someone say, it, such as, uh, you know, me and Scott and James and Kirk from Metallica. And the guy who worked little blocks and moved them around and so forth when I'm creating. Um, so, for me, you know, I love technology. I embrace it and... And uh, once again, it's it's it comes from my past. Um, I'm not one to conform to what is now. I'm one to hopefully look into ten percent of what could be in the future and and try to make that happen. And um, that's what I'm trying to do with you know with with Red Lamb and you know and and um, and, um, and break new ground. You know, no nobody in music has uh, has uh, stood for a permanent cause. Um, you, know, you know, meaning just bringing awareness about my daily life for me and Candy with, with our twins with autism. We're with Dan Spitz, lead guitarist of the band Anthrax. Turning Point with Frank McKay returns right after this. Welcome back to Turning Point with Frank McKay. We're with Dan Spitz, lead guitarist of the band Anthrax. Well, let's give that a little bit of a setup. Uh, I, I spoke to Candy, and she's doing wonderful work, and the two of you are just doing great stuff. Uh, Dan Spitz, uh, lead guitarist of Anthrax and Red Lamb, uh, is also an advocate, a uh, wonderful advocate for a very important cause, uh, and that's autism. And you have twin boys that uh, that suffer from autism, and that's what sprung you guys into action. Let's you know, Tell us about Autism Speaks and everything else you guys are doing. Uh, well, Autism Speaks is, is a, you know, the, the largest global organization um, uh, that me and Candy had found when our 
children were diagnosed, and they weren't born autistic, just so everyone knows. They were acting in movies with Maggie Gyllenhaal when they were nine years old or even actually younger. They were in commercials with Brooke Shields, so, you know, speaking and, and acting and all that. So, you know, there's, there's video proof, not by mommy and daddy, if you know what I mean, that, that everything was fine. And around 18 yeah. months or 16 months, they started to regress. And uh, at that time, you know, um, things like iPads and iPods weren't around to help and there was a lot of, let's say, uh, snake oil kind of stuff out there that people were trying to sell. And the first organization we, we found that was just basically, here's your truthful information, you know, was Autism Speaks. Like, we don't want anything from you. Here's your info, dude. You know, there's not even a blood test to know your kid has it. Um, blah, 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 blah. But the way they left the land after the concert, you know, like it was his land was destroyed. That was his, that was his income. Um, and he was pissed and swore that, like, you know, no one would touch my land again, you know. So he never let them build a monument. And once he was, he, he was dead, then it all kind of came alive. So, yeah, there's just music everywhere where, where I go, man. And where would Dan Spitz, lead guitarist of the band Anthrax? Uh, did you know Max Yasker, personally? Uh, yes, I did. I did know Max Yasker. My dad um, was uh, was a, an attorney that did a lot of work. Uh, uh, he's an attorney in Manhattan, but he did a lot of work for um, his friends up there. Where he was the you know, chief deputy sheriff up there, so um, he did a lot of work during the summertime for people and uh, the in need people, if you know what I mean, uh, yeah. for the community. And yes, Max was uh, was a was a friend that we knew. Yes. When did you When did you start playing guitar? Um. Well, I kind of followed suit from my brother. For those who don't know, my brother is Dave the Beast Spitz. He's played in Black Sabbath and White Lion and Great White. And as far as I'm concerned, one of the top bass players ever to walk the planet. Yeah. Um, you know, he's about he's five years older, right? Is he about five? He's years? about five years older now. He's an attorney down here in Florida as well. And uh, so, so he was always, you know, blasting me out of bed, you know, playing bass. And uh, so, as a little brother would do, I kind of followed suit, but you know, picked up the guitar and. My dad, um, his hobby was collecting really loud stereos, like giant thousands of watt amplifiers with huge speakers. And he was into uh, um, big band jazz, uh, Frank Sinatra, Benny Goodman, uh, guitar players like Django Reinhardt were, were blasting in my house at you know six in the morning on a Saturday, even when we were teenagers and you know going out and getting drunk and all that kind of stuff that teenagers do and not coming home till four in the morning at about six, you know, he, he, all of a sudden, you know, you're hearing horn sections blasting at a thousand yeah. watts in my house. So, <laughs> um, I had a funny childhood of, of not being able to escape music. And, uh, I'm very thankful for that. Um, because that's, I guess where my, um, uh, uniqueness of how I play came from. Um, and I strive for, I always, uh, strive for that. It's to me, it's not, uh, um, a matter of